I'm Madison Swain Bowden. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm going to be talking about forging the future, five years of fabricating with airflow, which is an intentional alliterative mouthful. <laughs> a little bit of a background about me. I live in Seattle with my wife and our three animals, and um, I've previously worked as a data engineer at the Allen Institute for Cell Science in Seattle um, for UCLA, the company that runs speedtest.net and down detector as a data engineer there. And presently, um, I feel like this is like the sponsored maintainership room because I'm uh, a sponsored open source maintainer of uh, the Openverse and Automatic is my sponsor. So a bit of an outline about what I'm going to talk today. I'm going to go through a couple of different air, uh, airflow eras. So we're taking a, a path back into the past of Airflow 1.7, and we're going to look at a couple of different versions between that and 2.7. Um, and we'll look at what a particular workflow looks like through all of those different versions and how things have changed over time. If we have time at the end, I'll also talk about some of the different use cases that I've used Airflow in because they're varied and diverse, but we have to, we'll see, you know, how time works. So let's start here, Airflow eras. I had a trial workflow that I wanted to take back in time because I've been using Airflow for five, maybe six years now. Um, I started off with Airflow 1.7, and uh, it seems like particularly past the 2.0 stage, there are so many new features that are coming out of Airflow constantly. And so I wanted to take a look back and see um, how much has changed since you know the since it, it sort of Airflow first broke onto the scene. So I have a trial workflow that we're going to be walking through. Um, this workflow is a couple of steps. The first step is determine a seed. So this is like some uh, you know, number that we're going to use for some further computation. That seed can either be pulled from the DAG run configuration or the variables. Uh, or if it's not in either of those places, we'll randomly generate it. Um, but then we're going to use that seed to check against some condition on whether or not the workflow should skip. So the entire rest of the workflow will skip if some condition is met. After that, we're going to generate five numbers with the seed into five separate tasks that each do some pseudo processing on the seed or on that number. Um, and for you know the purpose of this, this trial, those, ta those tasks could potentially fail. Um, and so we'll keep that in mind as we're writing this DAG. And then lastly, we're going to gather all of those available numbers that get processed and then do some reporting on it. So that's the idea, right? So let's walk back a couple of years to March 2017. This is Airflow 1.7. Uh, how many people have used Airflow 1.7 in this room? OK, nice. Couple of y'all. Great. So this might look familiar. So what's the first thing that I did as I started looking at 1.7? I went to the docs. And it was on read the docs, right? It was not the fancy new uh, doc UI or the doc uh, you know, website that we have. I actually had to use the, uh, the Wayback Machine, the Internet Archive, in order to view these because these docs aren't available anymore for Airflow 1.7. Um, in order to get this set up, I also used a version of Puckle's Docker Airflow setup. Has anyone here used Puckle Docker? Yeah, OK, same faces. Yes, OK, this was kind of the standard um, back in the day, or at least it, that's what it felt like the industry standard for like setting up a Dockerized version of Airflow was using Puckle's uh, Docker Airflow repo. So I went back to that and you know worked hard to get 1.7 running. Um, I was really confused initially because uh, I got the stack up, and then very quickly the scheduler died immediately. And I was like, what's up with that? Um, and then I recalled that uh, the scheduler was actually set up to kill itself after a certain number of runs. That was the optimal way to run the scheduler in 1.7, because sometimes it went a little haywire. And so their solution to that was uh, just set the container to restart and have it kill itself every five loops. <laughs> um, and then for, uh, it, it also took me like a long time to get the logs working on uh, 1.7. And that had to do because of like bugs in the actual code for like fetching the logs from a remote server and whatnot. It was a, a interesting experiment. So this is the code. I've split the code into two different sections. Like we have the DAG definition code and the actual functions. I'm sure you all can read this just fine. <laughs> kidding, kidding. We'll dive into a little bit of uh, the code here. The most important thing that I want to recognize as part of this, we're still on 1.7, right, is Python 2. <laughs> so um, when using Puckle's Docker Airflow, right, the preferred Python version for Airflow 1.7 was Python 2. I wanted to use the print function like as a function, as the Python callable in one of the operators, but uh, it gave me some weird error because uh, I had to actually import it as a print function because previously it was a built-in, it was actually a, like syntactic 
word that was part of the Python language in Python 2. Additionally, you've probably seen this in a couple of other talks I, I saw it earlier, but the, the uh, way to write a DAG and then pass operators uh, as part of that DAG was to pass that DAG object into each of the operators, right? If we wanted to use Airflow, um, like Airflow entities, like the, um, the task instance or anything that Airflow provided us, we had to set that provide context equals true flag on every single Python operator that used that. And then within the Python function, the actual helper function that we have, the context had to be uh, uh, used in the keyword arguments, and then you had to pull the entity out of the keyword arguments, and then you had to use xcom pull, uh, or in this instance, xcom pull from that in order to get the value. Um, and part of this too, which is important to recognize, is this assumes that you know the upstream task ID of the of the the task that you want to pull from, right? Um, also, if you, at the time, right, if you wanted to know more about how xcompol worked or you wanted to know the function signature, um, you had to go to models.py in the Airflow repo, and that file was 3,000 lines long. And so that was the documentation that we had available for that at the time, was going and finding that. I ended up having that page starred in my browser because that's what I needed to find. If we wanted to do dynamic tasks, right, in 1.7, we couldn't really do that dynamically because the um, Airflow, if there were a different number of tasks for each um, iteration of the parsing, then Airflow would just lose its mind. And so what we had to do was set up a finite number explicitly that each iteration was deterministic for, right? And so in this case, we're pro processing five numbers. We know ahead of time that we're going to be processing five numbers. So in the DAG definition, we're just looping over the range of one to five and generating tasks from that. And then when we pull that downstream, we had to interpolate the actual task ID based on those numbers again. One other note here, this is the reporting function, the like helper function for reporting, and you'll notice that it's logged on info. Couldn't use print for some reason. Uh, no matter like what you called within the function, prints would just never show up in the final logs. And then lastly, this is still 1.7. Didn't have any bit flow, right? The bit flow operators feel like such a like endemic part of how uh, DAGs are defined in Airflow, but as of 1.7, you had to use these set upstream and set downstream functions, which are not as pretty, in my opinion. And here we are. So I've written my DAG, and I tried to get it to run. And look at this beautiful UI circa 2017. Um, seems I have a failure in my DAG. All Airflow is saying is invalid syntax, line 45, in this file, good luck. So I, I found the error, and I was able to actually, oops, yeah, was able to get the DAG to parse correctly. And so this is what the DAG list looks like circa 2017. Take one step further and actually look into that DAG. A couple of things to notice here. The biggest thing for me was auto refresh. So if you kicked off a new run of the DAG, you had to refresh the entire page in order to, to pick up that new that new DAG run. Um, if you wanted to see it, once you had that DAG run, if you wanted to see those tasks running appropriately, you had to just smash the refresh button in the top right and watch everything go. Uh, there's no trigger UI or trigger DAG. UI from this page. So the only way to trigger DAGs was to either use the experimental web API, uh, add a entry in the database for a DAG run, which would then eventually be picked up by Airflow, or um, execute or like call the Airflow CLI and uh, initiate the DAG run there. And um, it might be hard, like, it's not something that you notice initially, but there's no enable button on the screen either. So if you wanted to turn this DAG on, you had to go back to the previous uh, DAG list page, turn it on, and then jump back into the, uh, the DAG graph view. Another weird quirk that, again, seems so obvious now is, is you know, because it's an integral part of Airflow, but all of the log attempts were just concatenated to the same file. And so if you had 11 different log attempts for a, a single task, or a d different attempts for a single task, those would all show up in the same file, and you just had to scroll down to the one that was important to you. Additionally, there was not really an option to handle failures and skips. So in this case, we have a couple of failures, but we're grouping them together, and we're still processing the rest of the DAG. If we wanted to handle uh, the, the uh, trigger rule for this, didn't handle the case where all of the tasks skipped. So if the entire workflow skipped, 
then those tasks still ended up being run. OK, so we're jumping forward to a couple years to Airflow 110. This is uh, February 2020. <clears throat> and I neglected to mention all this code is available on GitHub at github.com slash aetherunbound slash Airflow dash eras if you wanted to take a look. All of the Docker Compose stacks work, um, or they should. Um, and so you can you know, check this out and see the UIs yourself. Important note about 110 is it was the bridge version to 2.0. And so everyone was encouraged to get on 110 because it had compatibility with 2.0. At this time, we have our shiny new docs site, um, which is sort of much more approachable in my mind than the, uh, the read the docs instance of it. It's harder to see in this code view, but things are a little bit more condensed at this point. Um, we have the joy of using Python 3, which brings with it so many wonderful Python 3 uh, features. We can use the print function again within tasks, which is great. Um, there is a new trigger rule, which I'll show in a little bit, which actually does respect when all of the upstream tasks are skipped. And we can use, I'll talk about that in just a sec. So. As of 1.8, so here we are, we're on 1.10, we could actually use the context manager for creating a DAG, so we didn't have to pass the DAG, uh, the DAG object into each function or each operator, and so that's what that comparison looks like. So it's kind of nice. One interesting note with 1.10 is I still had to have the as DAG. If I didn't put as DAG, it would not parse the DAG page correctly, which threw me off. It took me, I think, 10 minutes to figure out why that was happening. And then I put as DAG, even though I wasn't using it anywhere within the context, and that made it parse correctly. Additionally, this was something that I ended up doing in almost every context that I was using 110 in. I had, um, I should say, with 110, we had the option to do templating, right, of, of variables that were passed into operators. And so I had this helpful function at the top that was just ti xcompol from some task. And then all I had to do was pass in the task ID into that, and that would fill in the value from whatever that xcom value is. And you can see that used below. The advantage here is I don't have to know what that task ID is anymore, or I can change it if I want. And so I can actually reference that task ID programmatically. And the advantage of this is that it makes the functions look a little bit more Pythonic, because I don't necessarily have to know about air airflow constructs ahead of time, even if I'm passing XCOMs function to function. Now, the unfortunate part about this is that with 110, um, the values were always handed into the functions as strings. So I still had to do some processing to get them, to marshal them into a value that like reflected what they actually were. In this case, I was just doing something really simple. So I just did the uh, AST literal eval uh, for those values. But you'll notice with all of the functions that I'm calling, I had to do that every time that I was pulling a function that was handed in from XCOMs. So we've gotten a little bit better in terms of what our DAG looks like. We don't have to know, you know, with the helper functions, we don't have to know as much about Airflow constructs in order to actually run the, the code that we care about. And then, like I said, we can use print again. <laughs> so this no longer had to be a logged on info call at the very end. We could be, it could be print instead. We have the bit shift operators at this point. Great addition. It makes things look like the flow that is actually shown up in the, in the web UI, which is fantastic. The UI hasn't changed much. At this time, we have a few more bubbles that like represent different states. We have a few more buttons in the links that we can actually click. Logs worked out of the box for this version as well, which was a huge bonus. Not a whole lot more information. In fact, no more information on the uh, DAG par error parsing errors. But first thing I noticed, at least, was that we have an enable button on this screen. <laughs> so I no longer have to go back to the DAG list in order to enable the DAG. Uh, task attempts, as of 1.10, were stored in different log files. And so I could navigate to a task and then check out the actual individual log for the failure that I cared about. You'll notice there is a trigger UI button sort of up towards the top right that's available with the UI, but you couldn't provide configuration for the DAG run. So it just started a run with no configuration. If you wanted to do a configuration, you still had to use those other methods that I mentioned previously. 
And lastly, still no auto refresh. Auto refresh was one of those things where um, I did not realize how much I needed it until I had to, I, I clicked a DAG to trigger it and then nothing happened. <laughs> um, and the, there was a new trigger rule that was added, which made sure that if all upstream tasks were skipped, that task itself was skipped. So we didn't have to build in any extra logic for nothing actually happening. OK, we'll jump forward one year. We've crossed the 2.0 barrier. This is 2.1 as of September 2021. And here's what our files look like. Again, I'll dive into some of the more important pieces. We no longer have to provide con the, we no longer have to set the provide context equals true value for Python operators that use Airflow constructs. We can actually just ignore that. Airflow does some magic as of 2.0 that will uh, determine whether or not it need your function needs anything from Airflow. Um, and so here in the report function, we're just calling the task instance, or we're having the task instance as a parameter, and then we can do whatever we want with it, and we don't have to set up. So we've actually reduced the number of lines of boilerplate that we had to have for all of those functions. We can render uh, the template objects as native Python. This was a huge boost, because now I don't have to do any like coercion, type coercion, or marshalling, or deserialization, or anything as part of my functions. They can all just look like normal Python functions, which is fantastic. And that's actually, yeah, here we go. So these are the two comparisons before that I made of having to call that function, that literal eval. And now we just have functions that look like Python. We have an entirely new UI that matches the docs UI that we saw earlier. Um, and this is currently the, the material or the material design UI is kind of the design that the UI that's currently being iterated on as part of 2.0. We actually get DAG error, DAG parsing error tracebacks now. So I can see where exactly in the file I've made a failure in my, my DAG authoring. The uh, trigger DAG with config is now available in the UI. So I can just hand in a, uh, a JSON uh, blob, and that will trigger the DAG with that configuration. We also get a new calendar view as part of 2.0, and the blessed auto refresh. <laughs> And just to so show the um, the skip workflow still behaves as expected as part of this. And now we'll jump to hyper modern Airflow 2.7. This is uh, new as of this month, September 2023. Might be hard to tell here, and I'll show the side by side, but this looks way simpler than all of the other iterations that we've looked at. And that's partly because I wrote this DAG using the task flow API, which was a new API, it was introduced as, as part of 2.0, but some of the more recent features of it really leverage, uh, are leveraged here as part of the, the DAG that we've written. So the, the, the DAG context manager now becomes a decorated function. We have parameters that we can describe. So if you don't define any parameters for a DAG, you actually can't trigger a DAG with any configuration in the UI at this point. Um, and so I had to define these parameters explicitly, but then uh, Airflow will generate a form for us, actually, which is really nice. The actual flow of the DAG looks much more Pythonic as part of the task flow API. We still have a little bit of the bit shift operators when we're um, trying to define uh, the, the flow, but we can use the outputs from the previous step as inputs from the previous step. And one thing that was interesting for me as part of this experience was seeing previously, oh, I think I'll get back to that in the future, but yes, it looks much more like Python code that you would just look at rather than like an Airflow framework code, right? Um, our Python functions now look like Python functions still, right? All of them are decorated with this at task or, you know, various instances of that. But they look just like and can be tested like regular Python functions. We This uh, DAG also uses uh, dynamic tasks. And so in this case, uh, we no longer have to have that number five, that hard hard coded value as part of the DAG definition. We can have one task spit out any number of outputs and then generate dynamic tasks based on those outputs.
And yeah, so this is a comparison between the bit shift operators and the actual flow as defined by uh, the task flow API. One thing that's interesting here is that in the bit shift version, the generate function actually uses the output of get seed. And it is a dependency as part of that chain, but it's not an explicit dependency, right? So in between generate is that determine continue step. With the task flow API, determine continue uses seeds or uses uh, the get seed output, and so does generate numbers. And so those ex or implicit dependencies that were part of that previous DAG, Airflow is now making explicit as part of this. And we don't even have to think about it. We just say this is an input of this, and Airflow will know, OK, no matter what you set your DAG up to be, this is a directly explicit relationship. Here's the UI. Not a whole lot of changes, except one thing I noticed was the running and failed tabs that are there. But we do have some massive changes with the graph UI. So we get both the tree and the graph UI side by side here with Airflow 2.7. The graph UI has been totally reworked. All of this is auto updating. The logs are auto updating. So you, if you click on the logs, instead of having to refresh that entire page, the logs themselves are updating. It's a whole new world. As I mentioned earlier, we actually get this form that Airflow builds for us based on the params that we defined for the DAG. So no longer are we just like sending some JSON blob into some Airflow CLI call. We can actually just trigger this through the UI. And we get some validation through that as well. And then we can also check uh, the generated JSON, which will be sent to the DAG to make sure that that looks as, as expected. OK, so we're going to jump through some side-by-side -side comparisons. Here's the DAG definition. On the left, we have the 1.7 version with all of the lovely provide context equals true, DAG equals DAG calls, et cetera. And then on the right, for the same four tasks, we even have the task definition for the do not continue that's, that's there. And it's still much, much, much smaller. And same here, this was the dynamic task, the, the pseudo dynamic task that was generating five different tasks. And then we're setting all of the downstream there. On the left is 1.7. And then on the right is 2.7. And for our helper functions, left we have 1.7, right is 2.7. On the left, you'll notice there's all this star star context, there's dot xcom poll, there's some like random strings that are in there for the task ID, et cetera. And on the right, it's just Python. We get to focus clear headed on the actual processing that we care about and don't have to worry about as much about everything else that's there. I'll give some quick UI side-by-sides to show how that has changed. One thing that was pointed out about the graph view was the um, difference in the number of task states uh, that are there. So the top one has only five, and the bottom one has like maybe 12 or so. We have a button for enabling the DAG. We have a button for triggering the DAG. We have all sorts of tools that we can use to introspect the DAG now. That to say, we've truly come so far. And ignore all that. Thank you.